Join us as Pastor Art Dykstra walks through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're going through the book of Jonah, and we're in the last chapter today. As you turn to Jonah chapter 4 in the Old Testament, I want to share a quick story uh, most of you are aware that God has called us as a small fellowship to do something extraordinary. We're stepping out in faith saying God wants us to work with uh, people struggling with addictions. And so we have a contract on a facility in Brooksville. It's an old Unitarian camp that's run down and uh, God gave it to us for an insane price. And uh, we're just trying to change the zoning. Part of that process, there was a guy who bought it, tried to turn this camp into a business. And the people on that street all kind of banded together and they protested it and could, they couldn't get the zoning changed. So now they're selling it. They already had it gutted. We have a contract on it based on getting the zoning changed out. Now you have a lot of people in Florida, right? And I've only talked outside of our church fellowship to a group of guys I play hockey with. And on Thursday, I had the opportunity. I have a single engine pilot's license and a, my old boss asked me if I could fly him to some meetings in Merritt Island. And in this meeting, uh, so I'm there. I'm not supposed to be there. I'm only there because I wanted to get some airtime. And uh, it's expensive, so it's like great when someone else is paying for it. And I'm there at this meeting, and someone says, Hey, Pastor Art, you're in a new role. Can you kind of share with us what you're doing? And I shared with them just a quick minute. And they said, Well, what else is God doing? And so I shared with them the U-turn, the U-turn for Christ project. Well, this guy comes up afterwards and says, man, I, I know the property you're talking about. I'm from the Brooksville area. And uh, they're really against anything happening and changing the zoning. Well, the next day I'm back here and I get a phone call from one of the elders at Calvary Chapel, Hernando. And he goes, hey, by the way, I wasn't supposed to be at that meeting last night, but I did. And I got back in time for my small group meeting. And while I was there, the lady who would cause the big stink over having this all there is in part of my small group. And so I just said, hey, what do you guys think if maybe a discipleship rehab facility opened in your neighborhood and everyone without exception was like, we'd shut it down. There's no way I want it. It's a good thing, but not next to us. And he said, well, one lady stood up and said, well, there, that's exactly what's happening right next to our house. I mean, what are the chances I meet somebody who has a life group person in, his, in their small group that lives across the street and was the lady who was probably going to cause a lot of problems. And so they had this great discussion. He finally says, look, I know the guys that are running this and they're going to put this through and it's not what you're thinking. It's not a flop house. They're really going to build into these guys. And she went from, I'm going to shut this project down to 180 degrees within one evening. I'm going to fight for it. Isn't that amazing? I mean, what are the chances? I just share this with you because there's story after story of how God is, when we give God the room to move and we go, look, there's no way we could pull this off. God, we want to see your mighty hand work. On our way back from our leadership retreat two weeks ago, Mike, Pastor Mike called up. He's just out of the whim. He said, hey, you know this, this restaurant called Grain and Berry on US 19? I was, yeah. And he goes, well, I just feel led to call them. I said, do it, man. He emails the manager, the owner, and says, hey, we want to start a food truck so these guys have something to do on the weekends and they can go to churches and have the food truck make some money and different things. I like just throwing out ideas. Five minutes later, the guy calls. He says, let's meet. A week later, Mike meets with him and he's already got a CAD design of a food truck, priced it out. And he's going to buy the food truck for us and donate it. He didn't even know he was a believer. And so we're hearing story after story. I just share that with this you this morning. Just because we get to hear all these stories, but I want you to hear the amazing stories of what our God can do when we allow him room to work because he's powerful and mighty and he wants to see people set free from their slavery. Amen? Amen. All right. So Jonah chapter four, one of the things that a lot of times evangelicals, uh, we as believers, uh, we spend a lot of time in the New Testament. We don't go to the Old Testament often. And it's a, kind of an error, really, because the entire thing is the Word of God, right? Given for us for life and godliness. So there's things that are really applicable. You just have to understand how to read them. And one of the things that God does in the Old Testament is he takes these broad brushstrokes, these big metaphors, and he speaks through a lot of times metaphors usually pointing to the coming Messiah, coming to Jesus, and you see it spelled out throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he largely uses principles. But he uses Israel, in particular, 
as a picture of us in many ways as the church. And so in the book of Jonah, we have said every single week as we recap, the book of Jonah wasn't written so that we could make fun of Jonah or go and say, oh, Jonah, you're such a mess up. The, the reason Jonah was written and was preserved is because it's a message for us. And in that message, it is clearly shown that this is God's heart. God's heart is for all people. It started in Genesis, right at the beginning, Genesis chapter 12. Actually, Genesis chapter 11, the table of nations, it's included. Why? Because I needed to know all these names of all these different countries. No, it's included because I believe it speaks of God's care for all people. And he chose an instrument called the Hebrew people to act as his ambassadors. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, he wants you to use it as an instrument to represent him. And what did they do? They turned inward. They missed God's heart. Genesis 12 says that you're going to be called to be a blessing. You're going to be blessed to be a blessing. And what did they do? They held on to that blessing. Okay, you can just bless me. I like that. I'm not going to go to the Assyrians. They're terrible people. They did all these awful things. Forget that. And they missed out on God's heart. It's a message for us because unfortunately we have the same tendency as humans. I'm going to hoard the blessings. I'm going to hold on to the blessings. I'm not going to do anything. And we miss out not only on God's heart, but we miss out on God's purpose to use us as an instrument in his hands. So God specifically is speaking to us about the failures of national Israel and our failures. So what happens in the story is Noah or Jonah, he finally responds and somewhat... Not with the right heart, maybe. And this outward conformity to obedience. But here's the thing also that I love about our God. Is that he loves people groups. He loves nations and groups of people. But he also loves the individual. And he's not content to leave Jonah. He's not content to leave us where we're at. And he says, I've got heart work that needs to be done in my prophet. Because he came in with this superior attitude. With a heart of vengeance. Look, I, I, can, I don't necessarily fault him because the Assyrians were just bad dudes. They were not nice people. The things that they would do to their enemies as they came in, they had no understanding as we're going to see the difference between right and wrong. And he comes in with a complete lack of grace. In fact, he spells out, we're going to see that he has more compassion on a vine that he had nothing to do with creating than he does on an entire city. The one, number one thing that Jonah needed, the number one thing, honestly, that you and I need this morning, that I pray, I pray, I pray that God would speak to us because this is so critical for understanding this thing called Christianity is that it's all grace, bro. I have this shirt on, not because I would normally wear a sh this for service. Our intern, we were putting some shirts, t-shirt designs together. We wanted a cool Feather Sound shirt. And this wasn't the one that we went with, but it's a quote with, um, it's a quote from a mentor of mine. He was... He passed away in his late 80s, and uh, he called everyone bro because he couldn't remember their names. It's, you give him grace, you know, late 80s. Um, but this guy was so loving and so kind, and he would just, it's all grace. He has an Irish accent. It's all grace, bro. Any situation you came. And so she put this shirt together, and I couldn't help but call the message today. It's all grace, bro. But you have to say it with an Irish accent. It's all grace, bro. Here's the number one thing that Jonah needed, what we need as well, to understand the things that go along with God's grace and what it means to us. Chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. All right, back up a, a, a verse. The people of Nineveh, they repent at Jonah's five words of preaching. Uh, he basically says, 40 days hence Nineveh destroyed. Five words. They repent and it was sincere. And Jonah, it says, is angry at that. Can you imagine you're a preacher? You're a prophet. You're called by God. This is your whole existence. And you're like, I'm, I'm upset because I was effective. <laughs> he hated these people so badly. And then he goes and he says and he prayed to the Lord. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish, to the farthest known region in the west coast of Spain. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. You know the funny thing about the wording that he used? The irony that you see over these next verses. The irony is that God uses that to describe his compassion 
on the Hebrew people. I mean, it just flowed from him because he knew it. This is part of their history. It's written down in their holy scriptures. Oh God, you're, you're, you relent. You're compassionate. You're abounding in love. And the irony of it is he recognizes God's character clearly and is so happy to personally receive the benefits of, a, of it for himself, but not others. Do you see the hypocrisy in this? And so here's this guy who's in his pure pride. I find it strange to think that we can know the character and calling of God so well. And yet we'll reject it thinking that we're wiser in our own mind. Jonah, what he did is he received a second chance, but he was unwilling for others to see it and to get it, to see others get it. In contrast, you look through other godly men in the scripture, you see the patriarch Abraham. You've got a similar group of people to the Assyrians, the people from Sodom and Gomorrah. And we use Sodom as a word for people who are perverted, you know. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah is a, is a phrase we use for debauchery. And these people were all off the rails. And yet here's Abraham in his heart understanding the grace of God. And he intercedes. Oh, Lord, if there was just 50 people, would you save them? Oh, if there was 30 people. If there's 10. God, if there's just 10 people. Surely there must be 10. Lot lives there. And he's got seven people in his family. At least if there's 10. I'm sure he must have reached more than that. And yet at the end of the day, this is what Abraham says in Genesis 18. Yet will not the judge of all things do right. Abraham understood the character of God clearly. And he understood grace clearly that he was willing to extend it to people who were really far gone. Yet Jonah does something else. And ultimately Abraham was willing to go, okay, God, I don't know, whatever you decide to do, if you decide to destroy them or not destroy them, I may not understand it, but ultimately I'll trust that the God of all things, the judge of all things will do right. A big, dis big contrast to Jonah. See, Jonah thought he was right. He put God in a box. Hey, God, you should do this because I think that's what's the best thing for my life and for you. And then you show his heart in verse three, Jonah's heart. Now, O oh Lord, Take away my life. Actually, it's probably with a whiny voice. No, Lord, take away my life. For it's better for me to die than to live. All right, so here's this guy. He's, he's angry at the Lord because he's having mercy. It's better for me to die. I mean, I, just that's his heart. He's a, a whiner. They're one of our founding fathers. I, when I read this, I always think of um, Patrick Henry. I don't know why. You know, Patrick Henry, for our found, one of our founding fathers. Give me liberty or give me death. He's passionate. And I thought of the... Uh, Far Side cartoon. If you remember Gary Larson from the 90s, you know. And I love this cartoon. It's Patrick Henry at home, theoretically, at home. And his wife says to him in their log cabin, for crying out loud, Patrick, sit down and enough with the give me the potatoes or give me death nonsense. <laughs> I mean, this is Jonah. Give him hell or give me death. I don't know, Jonah. You're really missing God's heart. Verse four. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah, do you have any right? Because I want to have mercy on these people. There's a lot of great questions in the Bible. It starts off in Genesis and God knows that Adam has sinned and he goes, Adam, where are you? Adam, what is it that you have done? God's not sitting there going, hey, I'm really limited in my viewpoint. He must be hidden somewhere. Hello, Adam. God never asks questions because he's limited in knowledge. He always asks questions for our benefit. Adam, come straight with me. What is it that you've done? Where are you? Where are you at? He asks us the same question. Hey, person out there, you, Sam, Sally, whatever. Where are you at with regards to me? What is it that you've done? Because the only way for you to understand is to un understand grace, is to understand what you've done. And then he rolls in and he says, do you have a right to be angry? It's not a question for God. It's a question for Jonah. And Jonah doesn't even answer it. You have a right to be angry when God does something that you don't agree with. I love the fact, and here's a little snippet of God's heart in verse 4. 
It doesn't say, but the Lord replied with thunder and lightning, and the Lord condemned him. It doesn't say the Lord shouted at him. It says the Lord replied. I think this is beautiful. He doesn't come in with anger. He just asks the question. And the ironic thing is Jonah tells us that he's angry at God because he questioned his goodness, and he accuses him of wrong. The reality is it's just simply sin because will not the God of all things do right? Will not the judge of all things do right? He knew his character. He just thought he thought better than God. How prideful is that? In verse 5, Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now here he's fully expecting judgment. Again, he's limiting God's grace. Okay, God, your grace can't possibly be great enough to cover this sin. There's no way you're going to do this. This isn't what you should do. I'm going to stand here and watch for destruction. There's no way you could forgive sin so great. And what he does here, and don't miss this, because I sat there and go, well, it says there, then he made himself, there he made himself a shelter. It's hot. It makes sense to make a shelter. Sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Why that's significant? Well, read verse 6. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. The first time in the whole book that he says he's, it says that he was very happy. The rest of the time he's just a whiner. What's happening here is that God asks the question, Jonah, do you have any right? Because he wants to point out, this is where your heart is, and I care about you as an individual. There is something fundamentally wrong with the way of your thinking that needs to change. Because if you're going to receive grace from me, you have to understand grace and give grace to others. And the grace of God in action is he provides this supernatural plant to grow up very quick. That provides a better shade in Jonah's life, despite his hypocrisy. Isn't that great? God doesn't get angry at him. Do you have a right to be angry? No, he doesn't. He asks them a question for his own benefit. I'm going to steer you. I'm going to take you to a specific spot. I'm going to provide you with shade. What this speaks to me is that what we do in verse 5 is we try to manufacture our own shade, our own comfort. We go through life going, my way is better. I'm going to build this. It's hot out. I need to deal with this. I'm going to build my own shade. And what God does in his grace is he comes along and provides us with better shade. Don't miss what God, I believe, is trying to communicate to us. Living under God's shade is so much better. Don't do things. Don't try to manufacture your own shade. Do it God's way. Verse 7 and 8. At the dawn next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, again in the whiner voice, it'd be better for me to die than to live. The first time he's whining about the God sparing and having grace on a people group. And then he starts to whine because of a stupid vine. Throughout the book of Jonah, we see a general theme. God provided the fish. That swallowed him. God commanded the fish. God provided the vine. It says very specifically, I circled the world. God provided the worm and God provided the east wind. The one theme that we can hang on to, that we can bank on, is that God is in control of our circumstances and the things that happen to that I can trust that the judge of all things will do right because he's in control. He's provided all these things and he's done it for a purpose because he's working on our lives. And the second thing is that God uses those circumstances to teach us. You're going through a difficult time. We mentioned a couple weeks ago, going through the storms of life, you can sit back and go, okay, is this a result of my sin? Not as punishment, but as correction. Or is God trying to conform me, change me, grow me through this? God's in control. And he's using these circumstances to teach us, to teach Jonah. He used the storm to wake up and grow Jonah, the fish to humble him, the vine to show him grace, and the worm and east wind to deal with Jonah's heart, that he was selfish. In verse 9, he asks the same question again, but God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Do you have a right to be angry about what I did with and how I dealt with the Assyrians? Now, Jonah, this silly vine, do you really have a right to be angry about it? And this is how he answers. I do, he said. I'm angry even enough to die. 
Do you have a right? You did nothing to get this vine, and you're complaining about it. We're getting a better picture of Jonah's heart. Jeremiah 18, God calls the prophet Jeremiah. He says, go to the potter's house. He goes to the potter's house, and he says, tell me what's happening. He says, the potter is making a bowl or something, and then he changes it after it's built, and he makes something wholly different out of it. And God teaches Jeremiah, who he even says, I formed you. I knew you before you were born. I formed you in the womb for a purpose. And he challenges him, do I not have the same right as your maker? This was one of the things that Jonah didn't understand. Because he was so bent on doing life in his own wisdom instead of God's way. Instead of seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things would be added to him. Verse 10 and 11, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? He's basically saying, look, Jonah, complete grace has been poured, about, poured out on you, but you care more about the demise of a silly little vine that you had nothing to do with providing than 120,000 people who can't discern their left from their right. What it is, is in Hebrew way of thinking, it's a euphemism for people who are ignorant. Oftentimes, most scholars are in agreement, it refers to children. They just don't know better. My kid does things, and you're just like, why you do that? It just seem right, you know? They don't know the difference. They're growing. They're maturing. So basically, this is what's happening here. Is there's probably five or 600,000 people in Nineveh. It is the great metropolis, the greatest city of the world in the ancient days of that time. Maybe 500,000, 600,000 people, if he's really referring to 120,000 children, which he probably is. And he's coming in and he's saying, Jonah, do you not even care for the 600,000 people that are going to perish? Do you want to have grace? Okay, okay if, if, if you can maybe understand the fact that these were terrible people. Okay, what about the 120,000 kids who just simply don't know any better? They're kids, man. Have compassion at least on the kids. This is a jab that he's going after Jonah's heart. And then he goes, well, you care more about the vine than you do about the kids? That's insane. And then what he does is he throws in there, and I believe this clearly, because why else would he include it? And what about the cattle? I mean, what a random thing to throw in there, right? Jonah, at least, please care about the cows. And so um, I found an... <laughs> apparently, we found an archaeological dig that had a billboard from the very first franchise in Assyria. And this is what happens when you prepare messages late at night. You do stuff like this. <laughs> and so this is the Chick-fil-A ad. What about the cows? Jonah, you don't even care about the cows, man. That's how hardened your heart was because of your self-righteousness. Jonah is the only book in the Old Testament, in the whole Bible actually, that ends with a question. I'm so glad that God has the last word. Because the question, and I really believe the answer is why it wasn't answered, is because this is a question for Feather Sound Church this morning. For us. Not just them, it's for all of us. Do you have a right do you care about these people? Do you care about others? It's a question that resets us off ourselves and onto God. Now, here's the interesting thing. Fast forward to the New Testament. Throughout Scripture, you see this principle that those who had an opportunity to know God's Word, who had God's Word in front of them and neglected it, have much more to answer to God than those who lack similar opportunities. Now, in view of that, this is what Jesus told the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes were the religious leaders. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. They knew it inside and out. They applied these things to their life. They lived and they were, he calls them self-righteous. You do these things, you look good on the outwards, but inside you're a dirty cup. You just go after the letter of the law, not the heart behind the law. And you are a robot doing these things, but it's never penetrated to your interior. And this is what he says to them. He actually quotes the story of Jonah. He says, the men of Nineveh will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Matthew 12, verse 41. What is he saying? The Old Testament, or the Pharisees at Jesus' time, they had the Old Testament, the Tanakh. They had the Bible. They had all this. They understood the character of God because it was drilled into them since they were kids. 
But here's the problem is they thought their righteousness was derived by their own inherent goodness because of who they were and because of what they did. Nineveh, in contrast, had five Hebrew words preached to them and there was a heart change. The message for us today is we have this Bible. We have online Bibles. We have access at the turn of a radio dial, dial CDs and DVDs and MP3s. If the Pharisees are condemned because of their access, will not the men of Nineveh raise up in judgment against us? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and so many of us don't. This is a message for the church here today. This is a message for America. Jonah felt he had a right to be angry. Why? Because he trusted in his position as God's man, his prophet, and his self-righteousness. Oh my goodness, my own goodness is so great. I earned it. I deserve it. Look who I am. I'm a prophet in God's chosen people. Of course I deserve it. You don't. His, his identity wasn't tempered by his desperate need of a savior, his desperate need of grace. And as a result, he wasn't willing to extend it to those who sinned against them. What if God treated us the way we treat others? It's kind of a scary thought. We're done in the book of Jonah. Here's a next slide. A couple weeks ago, in my quiet time, I'm going through the book of Hebrews 12, and the, orange, or the green part really stood out. It says in verse 15, Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. The word, make sure that no one falls short, it means, it's episkopos. It means to take the oversight. It means pay attention clearly that you don't fall short of God's grace meaning it's possible to fall short of God's grace or the fullness of God's grace, and that no root of bitterness springs up in our heart. I believe that God would speak to us this morning specifically that some of us in our tendency is to fall short of God's grace. I, I don't sleep well. I have issues sleeping, always have, but there are things that exacerbate it, things that cause me problems, th things that I can do to fall from the fullness of a good sleep, I guess you could say. I, if I have screen time, if I'm on my phone or whatever late, the blue light just messes me up, stimulates me, and I don't sleep for hours. If I play hockey or do exercise at night, done till 2 o'clock in the morning, just chemicals going through. As, it gets, as I get older, it gets worse. It stinks. Um, and there's different things. If there's stress or anxiety and I'm worried and thinking about it and dwelling on that instead of turning it over to God, there's things that I do that are downright sin that caused me to have sleep issues and help me fall from the fullness of a good sleep. I use that as an analogy because it's possible for us to miss out, as the writer of Hebrews says, on the fullness of God's grace. Paul actually even says that it's possible for us to nullify the grace of God in Galatians 2.21. And I get it. Just because we're saved and partakers of grace, it is still possible for us to fall short of the fullness to really embrace the greatness of what grace is, Galatians 5, 4. Before we get to the application and we finish the message off today, this needs to be answered, I believe, when we look at the idea of grace. What causes us to fall short or to miss the grace of God in our life? And they're spelled out right here in Hebrews 12 and following. In verse 15, it says that there is a root of bitterness that can spring up in our lives. The first point I would have for those who care to take notes is, is are we taking a personal offense? A personal offense. Has someone sinned against you? Look, our human reaction is always, I want them to pay. They've sinned against me. I'm going to do everything I can. Look, you go to most tribal cultures around the world. It's a vengeance-based culture. Our human tendency is, I need to take revenge. Um, Six and a half years ago, I went through a situation where someone really sinned very severely against myself and my family. And I always tell people, you know, the best thing to do is when you, when you pray, is to pray the scriptures. And there's a series of scriptures in the Psalms called the Precatory Psalms. These are the Psalms where David, in his frustration, he says, Lord, bust their teeth. And so for me, the, the temptation is, okay, I just, Lord, bust their teeth. I'm praying scripture. But that's not God's heart, to bust their teeth. The first thing that we have to understand that keeps us from missing out on the grace of God is this idea of personal offense. Why do I say that? Well, there's this great, here's Jonah. 
in a very real sense, almost guaranteed, Jonah had personal offense against the Assyrians. That's why his hatred was so great, why he was angry when God relented. Probably they invaded northern Israel. They were caught. They were their neighbors. They, t- they eventually did take them all completely captive. Not good people. Actually, they had already done it. And so you've got this guy who just despises. I'm not going to go to them. There's a great book. It's called The Bait of Satan. And the word in the New Testament for the bait, uh, for offense, taking offense, that Paul uses is scandalon. We get the word scandalous from it. The scandalon, though, in the Greek was, you got a simple trap. You know, a trap's not that complicated. Here's a rat trap. And you've got the, the part that swings down on the rat. <laughs> I saw some people jump. People that were sleeping, maybe. I don't know. You got the board. You got the spring-loaded trap. You got this thing that holds the spring in place. And you got this little piece here. And what goes here? The bait. The cheese, the peanut butter, whatever it is. In Greek, this is the scandalon. He brilliantly calls this book the bait of Satan. Why? Because the enemy's prime tactic among us as believers is he's going to come in sneakily. He's going to sneakily, however you say, whatever. He's going to come in shrewdly. And he is going to come in with a bait. A bait is something that looks attractive, right? You don't go fishing with a tire and expect to catch fish. You go in with something that looks tasty, like a pinfish to other fish. And he sits a little trap, and it's called a fence. Someone says something against you, whether it's your spouse, a friend, a neighbor. I could list off all kinds of relationships. He comes in there with this trap of a fence. And what happens is we take a root of bitterness in our heart because of not releasing this offense. And it prevents us from giving grace. So we miss and fall short of the grace of God by allowing the enemy to have a scandal on in our life because of personal offense. The second thing that this verse here in Hebrews 12 spells out is not only personal offense, but purposeful sin. In verse 16a, it says here, I make sure that there is There isn't any immoral or irreverent persons like Esau. Now, I get that all sin separates us from a holy God. We have to understand that. Sin is all equal in terms of its ability to separate us from God. But sexual sin seems to be in particular grievous to God. Now, of course, God can forgive any sin. He can forgive immorality. But Paul tells the church in Corinth, his grace is not a free ticket to practice immorality. In fact, Paul says that those who practice such things cannot, it, cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven in Galatians 5.19. If we're involved in practicing known sin, the solution to that is, is the same as in personal offense. Repent. Move to a life of purity lest we fall short of the grace of God. See, these are all things that hinder us from experiencing the fullness of God's grace. And in some cases, completely disqualify us. The third thing present preoccupation. He goes on and he says, like Esau, or a reverent person like Esau, who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. Not only does personal offense separate us from the fullness of God's grace, but purposeful sin, but this present preoccupation. What do I mean by that? The word irreverent here used in the CSB, it's a different word in the NIV, but the original Greek word is bebelos. It means unhallowed. What does that mean? It, it's bebelos is used for the person who lives without thought or interest in God. The person whose only thought is on earthly things. Esau simply wanted his temporary appetite satisfied. I'm hungry. You have some soup, Jacob. Give me your soup. I'll give you whatever you want. He was concerned about one thing, not about what God wanted his inheritance to be. And he, he changes that over and satisfies his temporary desires. This is a picture of us with our temporary physical appetites. This is what we do, relating this back to Jonah, is what we do is we, in our cleverness, we build shade, a covering of our own making. Hey, this is good. I've got my own plan. I got my own temporary covering of comfort in the hot desert sun. Because I'm so smart. Instead of being satisfied with the goodness of God's shade that only he can provide. And so there's a present preoccupation which causes us to fall from the fullness of God's grace. 
And the fourth thing, he goes in verse 25. It's not on this here, but if you're there, Hebrews 12, verse 25, it says, See to that you do not refuse him who speaks. Speaking of Jesus, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Pay attention to Jesus. If we reject Jesus' words, we're rejecting God's grace. John 14, verse 15 says, Those who love me are careful to do as I command. You want to experience God's grace in its fullness? Find out what he says. Apply it to your life. Do it. Now, okay, these are things that I just wanted to share of the things that keep us from the fullness of God's grace. Here's where we go into the application. John 13, verse 34 says, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He's painting a picture on, we follow the pattern of Jesus, do the things that Jesus did, and that's how we begin to move into the fullness of God's grace. Now, the ultimate goal of pastors, of shepherds, is not healthy sheep. It's not well-fed sheep. It's not happy sheep. These are all good things. But that's not the central purpose of us as leadership. The central task of the elders here at Feather Sound Church is to prepare us, you, for sacrifice. To model the kind of sheep Jesus is, a sacrificial lamb. To prepare us for laying down our lives. So here's the application. Three points before we finish. How do I lay down my life so that I might give grace the way I've received it? We have to understand grace if we're going to give it to someone else. The first thing three points, is universal sin. Universal sin. What do I mean by that? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That every one of us, all of us, have broken God's law. That we're all in desperate need of a Savior. And the thing that we have to understand is that it's not just sin against man, but it's also sin against a holy, perfect, and righteous God, an infinitely worthy God. Whenever you t talk in terms of punishment and talk in terms of the gravity of an offense, it's typically in relationship and proportion to the gravity of the person it's sinned against. I'll give you an example. If someone goes out there and there's this feather sound, so there's lots of mosquitoes, you squish a mosquito, people will probably applaud you. No one will ever start picketing your house. Mosquito killer, right? You go and run over someone's dog purposely, God forbid, and you're going to probably have a civil suit, maybe even some jail time. You do the same thing to a horse or something greater, and the proportion of your sin and your punishment goes greater. You do that against a human being, you're going to definitely do some jail time, maybe even lose your life. You do it against a sovereign, a king, a president, or something like that, and they will hunt you down, and you will be thrown away with their lock and key. And so here's the deal. The, Jesus is not like a president or a king is infinitely, infinitely farther worthy of glory, farther worthy of our praise, farther worthy. And what we do is we've exchanged and we've taken God's infinite glory and exchanged it for worthless things. Now, like all of us, I am a sinner and I'm in desperate need of a grace-giving Savior. If we get this and understand it, then it won't be a shock or a disillusionment when others mess up and need grace from God and us because we do. Jonah, like many of us here, didn't see himself as a sinner on the level of the Syrians. Yeah, we do the same thing. We see the addict, the bum, the guy down the street, the neighbor who's messed their life up. And we don't see ourselves on that same level. I think that's what God wants to correct in our heart. I mean, how come Jonah could complain about a plant dying because he felt he deserved it? That's why. How could he complain about grace on Nineveh because he felt he earned grace and they didn't? You walk through and you ask the average person, why does God deserve to give you grace and allow him to enter your king, into your kingdom? Well, I'm a good person is the average answer here in the United States. I'm a good person. I don't deny that most people here in this room, in this country, are compared to a lot of different people, are good people. But that's not God's standard. The application here is understanding that sin is universal, and that includes me. Do I think I deserve grace because I'm a good person? Do I understand the gravity of my sin? One of the things I've done in the last two weeks as I meditated on this, I have asked God to speak to me because I do believe I'm a good person and there's a degree of self-righteousness in that. That God would strip those things away from my life, that I would see my sin not in terms of other sin, not in terms of my sin against even individuals, but in terms of the infinite glory and goodness of a God who is able to fling the stars and the worlds into existence. 
because I was created for his glory. It's when I understand my sin, can I only understand the cross and how desperate I am in order to receive grace. The second thing, after we really understand universal sin, what we have to also understand as we look through the book of Jonah is unconditional love, that God loves me as I am right now, here I am, here I am. That nothing I can do if I'm in Christ can cause him to love me more or cause him to love me less. The beautiful thing in the middle of all this is that, that nothing is going to help make him reject me if I'm his. And if I really get this, if I really understand this, the beautiful thing is the only option then is to extend grace to others in the way that I've received it. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus says, if we forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, we forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. What he's doing is he's connecting the grace that we've received from God to the grace that we give to others. And he emphasizes it three verses later when he says, when he says, if we don't forgive the sins of others, our heavenly father won't forgive us. Now, we can give and receive unconditional love in the moment, but here's the beautiful thing about our Savior is that not only does he show us that there is universal sin, that we're in grievous need of a grace-giving Savior, but he also gives us unconditional love. And in that unconditional love, the only option is to give unconditional grace and love. But he also gives us unending love and grace. I love the fact that Romans 8 says that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Isn't that amazing? Nothing. If I am in God, nothing can separate us. That he who began a good work in me will carry it on to the day of completion. If I get this, I'll be able to grant grace to others 70 times 7. Despite the fact that people sin against us and continue to sin against us. And what he's not saying and what Paul's not saying and what God's not speaking to us. He's not saying and going, look, you just roll over sin. You don't deal with sin against you or sin that other people are committing. No, you do that, but there's a way to deal with it. You deal with it in love, but it's not up to us to not give them grace. God's love and grace is unending. Because I've received it, I can give it. Jonah is asked twice, do you have a right to be angry? Over the way I bless other people, And I choose to pour out my lavish grace. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? About me giving and taking away? Or do we go, will not the judge of all things do right? We declare God guilty for not giving things to us. We need to repent of that attitude. Will not the God of all things do right? If I'm withholding grace for another, here's the message today. I know the sin against you might be hard and difficult and real. But in the way we received grace is the way we need to give grace. Again, not excusing sin, but release yourself from that burden. If I am walking through life, not just simply because of myself, not because of somebody's not has sinned against me and taken a personal offense. But if I'm walking through life because I believe I'm good enough in myself, that's a problem. That's self-righteousness. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, that God freely gives to those who come to him, open-armed. God, I can't live up to the standard. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against an infinitely holy and an infinitely worthy God. And I'm in desperate need of your grace. I just finished the book of 2 Samuel, largely about King David. Now, we all love King David. I read to my kids twice this week the story of David and Goliath. We love to tell stories about King David, but honestly, I finished 2 Samuel embarrassed for David. Has an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, ends up killing her husband. He was a terrible father, did stuff he wasn't supposed to do, had multiplied wives, wasn't, was called specifically not to do that. I mean, this guy sinned far greater than any of us really in here. And yet here's a guy that's a man after God's own heart. He's amazing to me, and he doesn't deal with Adonijah and Absalom in the middle of their sin. Honestly, I I literally feel a little embarrassed for the guy. Yet his grandmother, Rahab the prostitute, a Gentile, through him he came. And through his line, the grace of God brought the Messiah. Through the grace of God. Because he was one to turn his life over. Not to rely on his own goodness. That he turns his life over to God. 
and says, will not the judge of all things do right? I repent. I'm coming to you open-armed in desperate need of someone to wash me, to clean me. It's all grace, bro. It's all grace. We finished last, the worship set off with amazing grace. This is what John Newton, the slave trader, who would buy and sell people. And he said, yet though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say that I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and to Satan. That can only happen from a grace-giving God because nothing that we can do to earn it. Again, I don't know if any of this penetrated your heart, but I challenge us that you would go this week and that you would ask God to show you specifically what it is that we've fallen short of, that we would have a clear understanding of God's grace, the infinite terribleness, I guess you could say, of our sin against the infinitely holy God. Now, there's two things that we do in life. We have to understand that our sin is so terrible that only God could forgive us and that only God could pay that penalty. But the other side of the coin is that we're so loved that God was willing to do that. You err on either side and you're going to be imbalanced. Oh, I'm such a sinner. And I sit there and I beat myself. Oh, I got to pay for it. Or I go on the other side. Oh, God loves me so much. I don't deal with my sin and the grievousness of it. I don't realize. And in my self-righteousness, I think I've already earned it. No, it's a balance between those two things. And that's God's grace. It's a really wonderful. You would call it amazing. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. The only thing I'll leave you with is if there's anyone here this morning that has never received God's grace, we invite you to come up after the service. Love to talk to you about how God's grace can be freely given as we surrender our lives to him and embrace God's plan for our life. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace. Lord, that you were able to take a wretch like John Newton, a wretch like us, a wretch like me, and that you're able to lavishly pour out our grace. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that is not exhibiting and giving grace because of the sins against them, because of a self-righteous heart that thinks that they deserve it, Lord, that you would do that work in our lives collectively and individually. Thank you for Jonah and the message for us that we would have a plan, a purpose in your plan to share the grace of God with others. Lord, we love you. Thank you for teaching us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about our church, you can check us out simply by going online to feathersoundchurch.com.